Amen. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to let you into a little secret. Over the last 12 months, I've really got into Lego. I found it a lovely way to relax and de-stress at the end of a day, particularly because you can't have any children nearby because the pieces are so small. I've recently built the DeLorean from Back to the Future. I've built the Home Alone house, and I've built Concord. I think it was around October I bought some shelves to put some of these displays up in my study. And it was only on Friday when I managed to finally get the shelves on the wall. So I expect next time you're in my study to all comment about how wonderful the shelves are and how wonderful the Lego is. As I came to pick Concord up, though, it had been stood on its end by a chair. I realized that some of the more fragile pieces had fallen off. It was no longer complete. I then spent about 15 minutes trying to work out how to put it all back together so that it was a complete model. Partly because I didn't want a child or a cat to eat any of the small pieces, but also because I knew at the moment it would not fly. As I was putting it back together, I managed to break off an even larger chunk. But then eventually, I got it all back as a complete model. I'm going to let you into another secret now, is that I absolutely love aviation. And growing up, spent far too many hours playing flight sim. Anyway, once I'd managed to get Concorde all back together in the way it should be, I put it onto its stand and placed the whole thing on the newly erected shelf. And I breathed a sigh of relief. It was safe. Rather than it being precariously balanced, standing upright on the floor, it was on its proper stand and safe on the shelf. And there it will stay. And I can see it from my desk. Why do I talk about Concord and Lego? Well, on a recent webinar, I heard Paul Harcourt talk about the church as being built on a rock. And at the moment, some people are trying to build an extension on the sand that will be swept away. The rock is the base of the church. It keeps it firm, it keeps it safe, it keeps it stable. In the same way that that stand keeps my Concord model safe and stable. The reading we had this morning from Psalm, part of Psalm 119 is another passage of scripture that speaks of its importance. After this last week of prayer evenings and a meeting yesterday at St. Francis with the Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship, I am even more convinced than last week that God is calling us back to the scriptures and in some ways back to basics. As I mentioned last week, the church has become something that is no longer recognizable as the church of God. As in those passage, those, that passage from Joshua last week, these verses from Psalm 119 remind us that we have to hold on to the biblical truths if we want to gather momentum as a worldwide movement of Christians. The passage reminds us of the importance of Scripture and how it can bring us wisdom and guidance. Sometimes, I think the church in the West has become satisfied with a passage of Scripture read at the front of church on a Sunday, thank you, Nao, usually given without any context whatsoever, then a sermon on the passage is preached, and then we carry on and go off and carry on with our lives as if nothing had ever happened. I think we've become content with that as a church. Not this church, but the church, the, the, the national church. We pay lip service to it, but we don't actually mean it. We don't read or hear anything ourselves in our daily lives throughout the other six and a half days of the week. When it comes down to actually living our lives out as Christians in the world, we don't know what to do because we don't know the scriptures well enough. As I've reflected on where we are as a church over the last few weeks, it feels like that series last year on ruthlessly eliminating Harry was the groundwork for 2024. 
we have to set aside some of the busyness so that we can use the extra time we have to invest in reading the scriptures in getting to know God better and digging deep into his word. When we dedicate ourselves to reading the scriptures and we become eager to hear what God is saying to us individually and corporately, I think we really will start to see a momentum shift in the church. Friends, we can't simply get all we need by attending church and listening to a sermon. We have to take responsibility ourselves. We have to take responsibility to get to know the Bible, to get to know the living God, to get to know his son, Jesus Christ, and to get to know the Holy Spirit. We cannot read the Bible through someone else's eyes. It doesn't work. That's not the job of commentators or preachers. Yes, they can help with the exploration of the scriptures and might get you thinking on a certain path, but ultimately... They are just talking about their interpretation. When I stand here on a Sunday, I'm giving you my interpretation. But each and every single one of us comes before the Bible in exactly the same position. Whether we've had theological training or not, we all come to the Scriptures in the same position, eager to dig in and hear God speaking to us through them. The Bible is a source of wisdom. It's worth spending time with it. It is easy to consider that people who have wisdom are the experts, the teachers, the elders, dare I say it, the clergy. But wisdom in God's teaching puts all of that into the shade and takes it all aside. Because when we study the Bible, it allows us all to learn. And as John Goldinger, an Old Testament uh, scholar, says... It's like a flashlight that makes it possible to walk a path that would otherwise be dark and dangerous, where we would not be able to see snakes or other pitfalls. I don't know about you, but I hate snakes, and I would not want to come across one. Indeed, some of the verses we had today, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It gives us light. It shows us the way to go. Last year, when we did that series, I ended it by talking about what is the watchword for the church. And I said I had a sense it was light in the darkness. In our reading today, your word is a lamp unto my feet, light in the darkness. I shared over Christmas, when was the last time you were in complete and total darkness? And I imagine it's a long time ago, because we have so much light pollution I don't think it is light pollution. It's the light showing us that the darkness cannot overcome it. How do we know that the light, the darkness cannot overcome the light? It says so in this book. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. Studying the Bible should bring us great joy as we explore God's word and we see the relevance of it for today's world. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to me and say, do you know, Tim, my scripture reading this morning was just what I needed to hear. Or, that's perfectly relevant to what's going on in the world. That's relevant to what's going on in the church. Friends, that is no accident. That is because God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what is going on. He knows what is going to happen and is putting things there so that we can take note that he is bothered about us, that he wants to know what we are feeling. He wants to guide us by looking at his word. He puts things in the right place at the right time so that we take notice. I wonder how many times have you thought of somebody in your mind and thought, oh, I wonder if that scripture verse is relevant to them. And you text it to them. I bet every single time you get a reply going, wow, I just needed to hear that right now. Again, that's not by chance. That's not by accident. It is by God and his Holy Spirit. 
In many ways, friends, we could say that when we study the Bible, the stakes are really high. It becomes a life and death matter. Life in Jesus or death in the world. Perhaps we struggle with reading scripture because there are parts we don't like or there's parts that we don't agree with. Perhaps it means that we have to look at ourselves and change the way we think, change the way we act, and we don't like that, that having to look at ourselves in that way. It challenges us to some deeply personal questions. And I think that's probably what puts some folk off studying the Bible because they're not willing to be molded and changed and shaped by the Word of God. Yet, like my Lego Concorde that is now safe on its stand, away from any chance of it being broken, we have to make sure that we are building ourselves on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ. For it is His church, and He alone will build the church. And the church is built on that rock. The church has a firm foundation. Whatever comes our way, whatever is thrown at us by society, whatever is thrown at us by bishops teaching erroneous doctrine, the church will withstand because it is built on a firm foundation. Indeed, we just have to look at the figures, friends. Back to that webinar I was on. When we look at the statistics... Churches that hold biblical truths are growing phenomenally in this country. Churches that are deviating away from Scripture and going with the world are declining phenomenally. If I had the slides, I'd put them up and show you. That trend is also represented in America. Every single denomination in America is on the decline apart from one which holds to the Bible. Friends, we are at a crucial point in the life of the church. Do we want to go down the line of the world? Or do we want to go down the narrow and straight path, less straight path, the difficult path, by following the word of God? So that we can grow as a church. If we just look at the figures, it's right there. The churches that are built on a firm foundation are growing. Indeed, we just look worldwide. All the churches that are growing in places where our brothers and sisters are persecuted. Why are they growing? Because they are building themselves on Jesus Christ and on the scriptures. Why are we in such a mess in this country? Because we've gone, actually, I don't like half of what's said in here. Let's throw it away. The time has come to discover this book for all that it is worth. Every 66 books, every chapter, every verse is in this book for a reason. That's why we're investing our time this year in digging in and exploring it. Psalm 119 that Naya read reminds us that the study of God's word is commended and encouraged for all sorts of reasons. Just read through those verses again in your own time. You will pick out every single reason why it's important. The word for teaching is Torah, something we probably all know. And it's likely that the psalmist had the Torah in mind, the books of Genesis to Deuteronomy, which in its capacity, those five books tell pardon me, teach that both, sorry, those five books tells Israel the story of God's early relationship with the people and it lays down God's consequent uh, expectations. Right there in the first five books of the Bible, it tells us the story of God's relationship with his people and it lays down the expectations of those people. That includes me and you. Also, the study of the Torah involves murmuring. When the Jewish people study the Torah, traditionally, they murmur it out loud. They take it on their lips, not just to teach others, but to encourage it to be part of their own selves, their own bodies. They want to inhabit what God is saying. Do we not want to inhabit the word of God for ourselves? 
not just read it as a book, not just choose those few verses we really like, even though we take the majority of them way out of context. But do we not want to inhabit the Word of God in our lives? If we are not caught up in the Word of God, how are we supposed to see? It goes back to that comment of the light in the darkness. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Verse 105. I go back to John Goldingay talking of the Word of God being a flashlight. Don't you want to carry that flashlight with you through the trials and tribulations of life? What is it that you are facing this afternoon? What is it that you are facing tomorrow where you think it's all dark and dangerous and you are afraid of the way forward? Take your flashlight with you. Take the Word of God with you because it will light your path. It will show you what to do and where to go and how to deal with these things that you are facing. It is all in here. I really need a big floppy Bible. I don't know if we're doing this, but there we go. It's a flashlight on the dark and dangerous path. We heard two parts of Psalm 119 this morning. It focused on the Word of God. It makes a plea to God that He would keep us safe and preserve our lives. Study of the Bible must become something as important to us as eating and drinking is for the physical body. We need the study of Scripture for our spiritual needs. Over the course of this last week, I've had a few conversations with various members of you, various members of the church, talking of this year being an investment in time. Of course, that book we gave you last week, and if you've not got one, let us know and we'll get one for you. It's a big, heavy book. It is a significant investment in time. Three passages of Scripture and all of the commentary. Don't let it intimidate you, though. Don't let this book intimidate you. Take it at your own pace. If you don't read it in a year, so what? As long as you develop that habit of reading the Scriptures daily. Perhaps you want to do like I was talking with somebody on Wednesday night. He said, well, I've, there's three passages, so I'll do one at breakfast, one at lunch, and one at dinner. Or tea for me. Or you do it all in the morning, or all in the evening. Or you do just the first passage this year, the second one next year, and the third one in the third year. However you do it, that is fine. Just make sure you invest that time in studying the Bible. Find a way that works for you. It might be that you prefer listening to it. If you struggle with reading, there's plenty of audio versions of the Bible. Indeed, a few years ago, Amanda decided to start listening to the Bible on her way to and from work. She listened to the whole Bible through a couple of times. And it was really interesting because her biblical knowledge grew. And she challenged me and said, oh, well, it says this in so-and-so, so-and-so. I was like, does it? A bit embarrassing. But she was quoting scripture. She was mentioning bits in the Bible. She was able to apply it to situations that she was facing in her life. All because she dedicated those journeys to and from work of about 40 minutes each way to listening to scripture. I want to encourage us all to find a way to do what works for us so that we can become involved in this book. We can inhabit the word of God so it is a flashlight for whatever is coming our way. On Wednesday evening, we looked at two questions that are posed by Nicky Gumbel in the early part of the Bible in a year about storing up God's word in our heart. It was relating to Proverbs, but the same applies here. The two questions that I posed... What do you need to do to allow God's word to be stored in your heart? And what does God promise if you do it? What do you need to do, friends, to allow God's word to be stored in your heart, to inhabit the word of God? And what does God promise if we do this? Two very important questions. But there are two questions that we can't answer on our own. 
one of the things from the Thursday prayer evening was that we need the Holy Spirit to enable us and equip us to be people of the word. As we continued in prayer on Thursday evening, I had a sense that the Lord is asking us to dedicate some time to being filled by the Holy Spirit, to enable us to get embedded in his word. I spoke with Wendy and David, and we felt it is important for us to do that today. Once we have received the bread and wine as a reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we're going to have some time to invite the Holy Spirit and ask him to fill us afresh so that we can focus on the word, we can inhabit it, so that it will become our light in the darkness. But let's hold on to the word of God. It is the most valuable resource we could ever have. If we are lost and unsure of what to do, go to scripture. If we need comfort, guidance, encouragement, admonishment, go to scripture. Because it is the living and breathing word of God. We can only read and understand scripture through the power of the Holy Spirit often the forgotten part of the Trinity. On Wednesday evening, we sang from the breaking of the dawn, and the refrain in that song is, I will stand on every promise of your word. It's repeated about every three or four lines. What if we make that our goal for this year? With the help of the Holy Spirit, that we learn as a church to stand on every promise of his word. Are you up for it? Thank you. <laughs> Do you want, friends, your faith to be built on the rock, the firm foundation? Or do you want your faith to be built on the sand and the extension that will be washed away? Let's stand on every promise of his word. Amen.